God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. This is John 12, 35, 36. So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. Okay, lots of light. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done, for what you've done in the lives of people, the people in this room. We thank you for the things that you're going to do, the things that you've planned. We thank you for your nature, that we know, God, that you are a God of light that there's not one shred of impurity, not one molecule of darkness in you, but that you are 100% absolutely perfect. We thank you for that, and we ask that this morning you would give us a better understanding of what that means, that we would understand more about you, we'd understand more about your Son, Christ, we'd understand more about who you've called us to be. Lord, I ask that this morning the Scripture would be Uh, so clear that I wouldn't get in the way, but that you would speak clearly to your people and that you would teach us all, conforming us into Christ, that we would be more like him, that we would be sons and daughters of the light, and that we would walk in the light just as you are in the light. Give us understanding and wisdom, we ask this morning in Jesus' name, amen. It's the message we have heard and proclaimed to you, God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. If you get this, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, that's where we are. If you get this, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, you will understand 1 John. If you understand verse 5, you will understand the rest of 1 John. But if you don't understand verse 5, you will not understand the rest of 1 John. So it's very important that we understand verse 5, wouldn't you say? Without it, we're toast. Uh, There are a few places in Scripture where the writer of Scripture would say, uh, God is something. It's not a super long list. It's actually a fairly short list. Now, I've written some of them down. God is a consuming fire, Scripture says. God is the God of gods and Lord of lords. God is a dwelling place. God is my strong fortress. God is my refuge and strength. He is the king of all the earth. He's my helper. He's my stronghold. He's the mountain of Bashan. God is a God of deliverances. God is the strength of my heart. God is the king from of old. God is a sun and shield. God is my salvation. God is the ruler over the realm of mankind. And God is the one who justifies. So that's a relatively short list. And an even shorter list is 
when it talks about God is something with no the or a or my in front of it. God is noun. There are very few places in Scripture where it talks about that. We just read one. God is light. Here are the others. God is good. God is judge. God is spirit. God is awesome majesty. God is one. God is witness. God is love. And then here in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, God is light. So when you talk about who God is, if someone were to ask you, well, who is God? You've got kind of a short list of things that you can say from Scripture. And one of them is in our text this morning, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you. Have you memorized it yet? God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. We must understand the theological importance of light and darkness. Uh, They are used especially by John throughout Scripture, but by the other writers of Scripture as well, to talk about really, really big truths. Uh, John is really good at taking big truths and making them sound very simple. Uh, One of them being this, that there's light and there's darkness. There's goodness and there's evil. There's purity and there's impurity. And we just looked at some other texts from John, from Rex and Scott and Andy. John chapter 1, when Jesus came into the world, it says the light came into the world. Well, God is light, so that means God was coming into the world. Jesus came into the world. He was the light shining in the darkness. In John chapter 8, verse 12, that Scott read, Jesus said, plainly, I am the light of the world. It would be a very arrogant statement if it weren't so true, wouldn't it? John chapter 12, that Andy read, believe in the light. Okay, Jesus came into the world. John the apostle said, it's the light coming into the world. Jesus stood in front of people and said, I am the light of the world. And then John urges later uh, in his gospel, it's Jesus speaking, saying, believe in the light. Believe in the light and you will become sons of the light. Other places where Jesus was teaching, he told his disciples, you are the light of the world. If you are sons and daughters of the light, then you're expected to be the light of the world, to take the good news to those in darkness. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians, three different places. He says these things, that the God of this world, Satan, blinds people from the light of the gospel. The gospel is the container of light that we can take to the world. If they believe, then they can see the light and they can become sons and daughters of the light and they can have union with the light, who is God. But Satan's job is to blind people from the light of the gospel. That's 2 Corinthians 4. In 2 Corinthians 6, Paul says that light has no fellowship with darkness, that you can't mix the two. He's talking about uh, church. When you come together as God's people, you can't bring all the worldly things in. You can't bring all the false gods in because that's darkness. And darkness and light can't mix. We'll talk about that more later. And in 2 Corinthians 11, Paul says that Satan himself will disguise himself as an angel of light. The angels put forth light because they're from a heavenly purity that we don't fully comprehend. And Satan, to disguise himself, presents himself in in some instances as an angel of light. In Ephesians, Paul says, you are light. Capital L, Paul says. You are light, the church of Christ, all God's people. So since you are light... Walk as children of the light, Paul says. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul says that we share our inheritance, what Christ has given us, we share that with the children of God in light, with the saints in light. Our inheritance is shared in the light. That's where it's found. 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul talking about God, he says, God dwells in unapproachable light. It's a light that we can't even approach this side of heaven. You can't see God because He dwells in unapproachable light. James chapter 1, James, the half-brother of Jesus, he says that God is the Father of lights. 
Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. And then we just sang a song this morning. The revelation of Jesus Christ, that song, talks about in the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no need for lamp, there will be no need for sun, because who's going to be our light? Right, there will be God in the midst of us. There will be no need for temple, no need for sun, because the Lord is our temple. The Lord is the sun. He is light. God will illumine the earth and the new earth. Aren't you looking forward to that? So God is light. Let's break this down. What does that mean, that God is light? Well, let's start off. You have your notes. You can fill in the blanks that are there. He is pure holiness. God is light. He is pure holiness. And it's by necessity because of His nature. Because of the nature of God, who God is, what it takes to be God, it's necessary for Him to be pure holiness. To put it another way, To be God, if you wanted to be God, or if anybody in the world wanted to be God, you must be absolutely right. You must be absolutely 100%, positively, not 999 times out of 1,000, but we're talking 1 trillion out of 1 trillion times right. You must be absolutely right to be God. And this goes back to our theology of who God is. It's called theology proper. If your mind can go there from the lessons you've heard, one of the ways that we can answer, what is God? If someone were to ask, what is God? We can say, He's the one who's always absolutely right. You can't say that about anybody else or anything else. Not even Siri on your iPhone, right? Or ask Google. They're not 100% right. God is the only 100% absolutely right. And so the other side of that coin is a flawed God is a false God. If your God, small g, God is flawed, your God is false. And that's talking about a God that has been erroneous in any way at any point in history. If you think back to another time, even if it was a trillion years ago, thinking back, And well, my God made a mistake, or He didn't know about this, or He didn't know about that, or He couldn't do this. That's a flawed God. If you think at any point in the future there is something that might surprise your God, your little g God, then that means He's a false God because He's flawed. So a God that has been erroneous in any way at any point in history is a false God and or a denial of God's omnipotence, okay, if your God is not all-powerful, if He can't do what He sets His mind to do, then He's not a real God. If He's not all-knowing, if He's unsure about what happened before or what's going to happen next, He's a false God. If you deny that He can't be everywhere at once, He's not God. What kind of God is that that's limited in time and space? That's a little g-God. That's a flawed God, a false God. If you have a man-God, that's a false God because men are flawed, aren't they? If your God was a man at any point in history, it's a false God. If you have an animal God, it sounds crazy to say, but it's what some people believe. If you have an animal God, you have a flawed, false God. A material God, Isaiah talks about this. If you build your God out of wood or out of stone or out of iron and you say, this is my God, how silly. That's certainly a flawed God, a false God. To be God, you must be absolutely right. And so a basic definition of God could be the one who is always right in word and in deed. God is the one who is always right in word and in deed. And since He's always right, He is light. God is light. He's also eternal light. Think back all the way that your limited mind can let you think back. All the way back in history, God was light then, just as He is today. Think all the way to the future All the things that can happen in the universe in the next however many years. Think all the way into the future. God is still light, just as He is today. 
When John wrote this, God was light just as He is today. And of course, today God is light just as He is today or just as He was then, just as He was in eternity past, just as He will be in eternity future. God is light, eternal light. He never changes and He's never changed. There has never been a time and there never will be a time when God is not, was not, won't be light. He will always be light. God is light by necessity of His nature. And there are three ways in which God being light is manifest to us. Three ways that we can clearly perceive that God is light. One is in His wisdom. And in His truth, and in His love. In His wisdom, in His truth, and in His love. God's wisdom is light because it certainly supersedes all human wisdom. We even mentioned that in the other song that we sang, the third song. Human wisdom's fleeting light. That's a different kind of light than God's light, isn't it? God's wisdom is eternal light. It's powerful light. And it's perfect in every way. He has no flaws in His wisdom. There's nothing wrong about what He says. It's all wise and true. And His wisdom is perfect for every person. You can't go to the book of Proverbs and find a part that doesn't apply to you. If you're reading through the book of Proverbs, every verse in that book will apply to you. That's God's book of wisdom. And in fact... I would challenge you to find any verse in the Bible that doesn't directly apply to you. Every verse applies to you. His wisdom is perfect for every person. His truth. His truth is an example of how He is light because, of course, He's the origin of truth. And there's no truth outside of Him. If you take God away, that is to take away all truth. If God is out of the picture, there's nothing left but lies. There's nothing left but bad teaching and error and falsehood. God is truth. He's the origin of truth. And outside of Him, there is no truth. You must go to God for truth. And, going a step further, He delivers that truth to His creation perfectly. Not only is He the origin of it, not only does He contain all of it currently, but He also shares it with us perfectly. If you want to know truth, well, it just so happens that God has preserved His Word, and right now I'm using the New American Standard Bible, which we all know is the best translation, right? It's got the goatskin leather cover on it. It's got the nice edges uh, so they don't fray or get dirty. It's got two ribbons. It feels very nice in my hand. I have no uh, issue understanding what it says whatsoever. It has all 66 books of the canon that have been determined by God's people long ago, and it's all there for me. In fact, I can go to the back here, and I can look at certain maps. I can look at the uh, divided kingdom, Israel and Judah, what that looked like at that time, the Assyrian Empire. I can look at that if I wanted. I can write all kinds of notes in the back of Scripture as I learn things. And if I wanted to find a verse, I have a handy concordance in the back that helps me to find a verse because I might forget where it is. I have all of this in front of me and to say, well, God just hasn't done enough to show me His truth would be a complete and utter lie. There are many people in the world who don't have access to this complete Scripture in whatever translation they want that feels so good in their hands that comes with so many tools. So at least in America, there is absolutely no excuse to say God has not delivered His truth perfectly because He has. He's placed it in our hands so affordably, and if you don't have a copy of Scripture, I'd love to buy you a copy. It can't get much more perfect than that, right? Free? (laughs) And of course, I would buy you the best translation, which is the New American Standard. God shows us His light in His wisdom, in His truth, and in His love. The light is the only source of forgiveness. Think about that. What love? The light is the only source of cleansing. We're going to talk about that in this passage this morning. And the light is the only source of reconciliation. You know, we talk about when people are trapped in sin or they're doing things they shouldn't be doing, we can urge them, come to the light. Let's expose this issue. Let's take care of the issue. 
God does the same thing. He calls sinners into His light, come into the light, and what happens there is there's forgiveness, there's cleansing, and there's reconciliation. Because even though we bring a whole bunch of baggage, we bring a whole bunch of wrongdoing, we bring our evil, all of our warts and weird personalities and all that stuff, we bring it into the light. God not only takes care of the issue, but He also reconciles us to Himself. He gives us a relationship with Him, a new relationship, one that we didn't have because we were born into sin, one that we've never known, a perfect Father loving His children were adopted in that moment in the light. Perfect love. He shows us His light in His wisdom and in His truth and in His love. So God is pure holiness. That's what it means when it talks about God is light, it also means this. He has nothing to do with darkness. God has nothing to do with darkness. If He is light, He cannot have anything to do, whether it's on a minor scale or a major scale, He can't have anything to do with darkness. Because as you know, think about science for a minute. What is darkness? Who knows? Good. Darkness is the absence of of light. So if there's just the tiniest little bit of darkness in God, He's not light anymore, is He? Because the two absolutely cannot mix. They're, there's a firm line in between light and darkness that they can't cross. You take away light, there's darkness. You start inserting darkness into light. What that means is the light is fading away and that darkness is taking over. And in God, it says in verse 5, there is no darkness at all. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. So the definition of darkness, we could say, is wrongness. If light is holiness, if light is rightness, then darkness must be wrongness. Another way to say that is, Light must be 100% right. Darkness is any wrongness. If light is right, darkness is wrongness. Light must be 100% right. I I can't overstate that enough because we tend to think in human terms. uh, For instance, in baseball, if a guy hits the ball 30% of the time, he's an excellent baseball player. Okay, That is a definite human standard, okay? That is not God's standard. To be right, to be light, to be perfect in holiness, you have to bat a thousand. That's a hundred percent. There must never ever be a time when you go up to bat and you don't get a hit because that would be darkness. The two cannot mix. You're one or the other. Light means you are one hundred percent right. You must be perfect. And darkness then is any wrongness. If you go up a thousand times to bat and that one time you didn't get a hit, you're not light. You are in darkness. What are some examples of darkness? Well, there's sin. That's probably the most obvious one, right? There's sin. Intentional disobedience. God says, do this. You don't do it. God says, don't do that. Of course, you do it. That's sin, intentional disobedience. And that's little stuff to big stuff. That's telling a little white lie that you think no one will be affected by, which there's always someone affected by it, namely yourself. Okay, Um, Little stuff to big stuff. Whether you tell a white lie, whether uh, you're taking an airplane and flying it in to a building and killing a bunch of people. Okay, those are both sin. Those are both evil. We can talk about uh, the degrees of evil at another time, but for now it is sufficient to say any darkness is wrongness and sin, the whole scale of sin, encompasses that because sin is evil. That's one example of darkness. Another example would just be error. There are some times that you do the wrong thing and it's not sinful. You just made a mistake or it was an accident. You stub your toe, right? And you ruin your day. Then you sin and ruin someone else's day, usually. That's how that works. But you make a mistake or a misguided decision. You buy a bad car. 
Okay, that wasn't sinful. That was just stupid, right? Uh, erroneous. It was a mistake. Well, if you're completely light, if you're perfect in light, you're not going to make those mistakes. You're perfect in wisdom and in truth and in love. So even a misguided decision is an example of darkness because you're limited, you're flawed, you're bound to sin, you're of the world. Now here's the umbrella term, the big definition of darkness that encompasses everything. It's a denial of God and His Word. And we'll talk about this more, but it's a denial of God and His Word. The world that we live in today is full of darkness, isn't it? You cannot watch the news anymore. Um, Who knows if there ever was a time when you could watch the news and just hear happy things, right? But you can't watch the news anymore and hear something that is just mind-blowingly evil. I know it didn't used to be that way. It's nearly every night. It's gotten to the point, uh, I was at work, I guess this was a couple weeks ago, and it was middle of the day, a coworker came in and said, hey, did you hear about what's going on in Berlin? And I just said, what, some Muslim guy is going crazy there? Not even a surprise anymore. Um, I don't know if the guy was Muslim, but of course there was a maniac going through killing people. That's just what you assume anymore, is that people are dying that there's murder, that there's wicked murder. Someone came up to you and said, hey, did you, you, know, you hear about what happened in the bus station at New York City this morning? That's where your mind would go. It's not even a surprise. And because of that, I didn't even have any kind of emotional reaction to that. I should, knowing that those people are made in the image of God, that those people were either recipients of God's grace or potential recipients of God's grace through the gospel, there should be some kind of a heartfelt reaction to that where you grieve over the loss of life. But anymore, we're just so numb to death. It's just, well, you know what happens. Think of abortion. The numbers on abortion are staggering. The deaths that happen every day, every week, every month, every year are mind-blowing. I mean, we wouldn't, we wouldn't even be able to guess how many abortions on average happened since I started this message. And we're just numb to it. It happens. Do, do we continuously grieve over it anymore? By far, most of us do not. Because we've become so accustomed to darkness. We've become so accustomed to a denial of God and His Word, this world that we live in, that we forget really how good the light is. We forget just how precious, how true, how wise, how loving the light is. And so this morning, if we can really get a firm grasp on God being light and in Him being no darkness at all. And I should tell you that this is exaggerated in the original language, which is Greek, that no darkness at all is like three exclamation points. In Him there is no darkness! It's very good news, because if there was just a sliver of darkness in the presence of God, we would have nothing to look forward to. But remember, our inheritance is in the light. And we know that whenever we see God and we know Him, even as we are known, that there will be a perfect atmosphere there, that we have a lot to look forward to. So God is wholly perfect. He is absolutely perfect. He is separate from anything wrong. God is light. Okay, Think of it as just being uh, God is light so far this way. There is no darkness in Him at all. Darkness is so far that way. God says He's cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. Okay, Maybe the east is light and the west is darkness. He's taken that sin and thrown it so far away. They're going in opposite directions. They'll never touch. They'll never mix. That's the hope that we have in the nature of God. And so now the rest of this passage we're looking at this morning and the rest of 1 John tells us that God calls us to walk with Him in His ways. Okay, so that's on your sheet there, that God calls us to walk with Him in His ways. He is light. Now, He's calling you to walk with Him in His light. Let's look at verse 6. 
If we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus' Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say, verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness. So this is the first if in the book of 1 John. We're going to see a lot of if um, proposals throughout this book, the five chapters of 1 John, and they're tests. And these tests are generally aimed at you. They're aimed for, uh, or they're written for you to look inward, to think about yourself, think about how you're living, um, what you believe in, what you say you believe in, how you live that out. It's all about um, looking inward, okay? So as we look at all these if statements of 1 John, I want to go ahead and say this now and hope that you guys remember. Don't start thinking about someone else in the room, okay? And also, don't start thinking about someone outside of the room. Those are the two areas where you can't think about someone other than yourself. It can't be someone other than yourself in the room. It can't be someone outside of the room. That means only you, right? Because John, the Holy Spirit through John is writing this book, number one, to assure you that you have eternal life. That's chapter 5, verse 13. At the end of his book, he says, I've written these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. But he's talking about people and what people say and what people do. And so we really need to think inwardly when you see an if statement. Don't start thinking about somebody else. And what this assumes is that you care. So if you care, think inwardly, uh, think about it seriously, and ask God to make you into the man or the woman that He wants you to be. Okay? Um, So here goes John in verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, who is He asking? If If we say that who has fellowship with Him? Go ahead and say it. We. We. Okay? So generally speaking, the if tests are for... Uh, individuals, and even this one is for the individual, but this one's also for the church body collectively. If we say, so now you can think about us as a team, okay? Don't start thinking about us as individuals and how everybody else is worse than you are. Okay, think about us as a team. If our team says that our team has fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, our team lies and does not practice the truth. Okay, so just think as a team here. What do we claim? What does our team claim? Think about that. What does our sign say? Payson Bible Church, right? We are a Bible church, which means we say that we hold this book up, that it's worth looking at, at a minimum, right? That it's worth studying, that it's worth um, looking at so that your life may be changed. It's worth... Um, hearing sermons from every week. It's worth going to multiple classes each time a week to learn more about this. Hey, that's what we're saying. That's what our team is saying. And you could say that through those things, we have fellowship with God. In fact, that's what we would say, right? We would invite people to our church saying, come learn about God at Payson Bible Church. You want to know about God? Let's look at the Bible together. If we say we have fellowship with Him, and I would say that we are, and if we're walking in the light as He is in the light, we have a right to say that, okay? But for now, we can just state it plainly, Payson Bible Church says that we have fellowship with Him. What does fellowship really really mean? Uh, Simply put, it's union with Christ, knowing Him. Fellowship means to... uh, know who He is, have Him work in your life, to have a special relationship that comes from knowing Him, a special relationship that includes enjoyment and participation. Participation meaning you've been changed and you want to do the things that He calls you to do in Scripture. It's a special relationship. That's what fellowship is, union with Christ. And of course, we have fellowship with one another, um, which we'll look at in a minute. 
But the point here is we can't have that union with Christ. We can't have that special relationship with Christ. We can't have fellowship with Him if we walk in the darkness. Walk, of course, is a uh, metaphorical term talking about living your life. If you live your life in the darkness, you can't have fellowship with Him. Paul makes this same argument. If you want to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 14. I referenced this verse at the beginning. We're going to read five verses here where Paul is saying the same thing. If we have fellowship with Him, that means we don't have the association with darkness that we used to have. 2 Corinthians 6.14 It says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. We sometimes use this passage as a uh, reference text for marriage. Okay, if a believer is thinking about marrying an unbeliever, we could reference this and say, uh, you know, it says fellow, the fellowship between light and darkness is different than that. It, there shouldn't be that close of a union between light and darkness. Obviously, the light has to go out and proclaim the gospel in the darkness, but you don't uh, marry the two. That just doesn't work that way. That's one way to use it, but the text, the context of the text, is about the church. If we are... God's people set aside to be holy for Him, to be changed by Him, to look like Christ, to be Christ's body, to be empowered by His Spirit, to proclaim His gospel, to uphold and honor His Word, to be people who pray to Him, to be people who love Him and love one another. If we're called to be those who serve, if we're slaves of Christ, and we not only want to serve Him, but we want to serve other people, if we want to wash each other's feet, if we want to lift up high the glory of God and make His name famous, Yahweh, the God of Israel, Christ, the one who is the light coming into the world, if that is our job, what business does this church have to do with false gods, with darkness, with lowering God to a more comfortable level, to, to skipping over parts of of His truth that He's given us. What purpose is there in that? It doesn't work. Light is light, and darkness is darkness, and the two don't have fellowship together. We are squarely placed in the light as God's people. Not that we're perfect, but that He has called us perfect by His grace. Amen? So He calls us perfect, and then He calls us to live in a certain way, a way that's different from the way we used to live, a way that's different from the way of the world. We're called to be in the light together, having fellowship with Him. And so if we're going to proclaim that we, our team, Payson Bible Church, has fellowship with Him, we can't be walking in darkness. We can't be bringing in false teaching. We can't be bringing in sin into the fellowship. We can't let bad things, evil, um, divisiveness, bitterness, we can't let those things fester up because we can't be who God wants us to be while that's happening. Christ and His Word have first place in this church. They do not have second place. They do not take a back seat. But Christ and His Word have first place in everything at Payson Bible Church. He has called us to be in the light, to have fellowship with Him, and to not mix any darkness because the two can't have fellowship. We're called to be in the light. Continuing in 1 John, it says, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So what does that lie look like? 
It's, again, as I told you earlier, a denial of God and His Word. That lie would be saying that God is God and then living like He's not. That's not exactly a lie that you say with your mouth. It's a lie that you say with your actions. God is God. And then you live life like He's not. You could say that God's Word is true and then live life like it's not. You're lying and not practicing the truth. God has called His body to proclaim Him and to proclaim His truth. If we're not doing that, then we're lying and we're not practicing the truth. And then verse 7, it says, But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Imperfect people can have perfect fellowship through the sacrifice that Christ made. Imperfect people can have perfect fellowship because God has transferred us out of the domain of darkness and placed us squarely into His marvelous light. If we believe God in His Word and if we're seeking to implement those principles in our day-to-day life, we are in the light. We're walking in the light. We're knowing Him, living a life of knowing God, fellowship with Him collectively. Did you know that? That knowing God isn't just an individual thing, but that we do that together? That we are His bride collectively? That we are His body collectively? And that we can know God and walk with God together, not just individually? That God doesn't call you to come to church to learn a bunch of things so you can go do things on your own. But God calls you to come together with His people so you can learn things and learn about Him so you can do life together. Because again, it's talking about we. If our team, if Payson Bible Church walks in the light as He Himself is in the light, we, our team, Payson Bible Church has fellowship with one another. We're doing the Christian life together. That's fellowship. It's knowing Him. It's knowing each other. It's fellowship. And what's so beautiful about this is it's not a program. God didn't give an A, B, C, this is how you do it. He didn't strip everybody's personality away. He didn't say, you know, just be a mindless drone and follow these rules and then you'll be in the light. God calls us into the light And what does He do? He gives us grace. Now, that just makes it hard, right? (laughs) He calls us together, different people with different preferences. We have different theological takes on things. We have different opinions about how to do things. But He's called us to be together and to have fellowship with one another, which means doing the Christian life together. There are people from all kinds of walks of life in here this morning. We might all kind of look the same if, you know, someone from, uh, I don't know, you know, we think that all uh, Asian people look alike, right? If one of them came over here, they'd say, we all look alike, uh, probably, okay? We all look pretty similar. But we all come from different backgrounds. We have different experiences. We've been raised with different ways of doing things. But if we can agree on who God is and what His Word says, we can have fellowship together while still maintaining grace. We can still give each other some breathing room. We're not pushing each other around and giving each other orders and saying, you know, hey, if you want to be a part of this church, you've got to do this. And here's your one, two, three step, and we're going to check up on you and make sure you did it just as we told you. That's not how God works. He's given us His Word, His truth, And he says, there's grace, don't cause each other to stumble, edify, encourage one another, build one another up, and just have love and obey my word. That's what he's called us to do. Makes it hard, but man, that's so much better, isn't it? You get to keep your personality, isn't that nice? Even if nobody likes it? No, I'm just kidding. Um, You get to be who you are in Christ, and he'll change you. We can gel together because of the common light. If you turn again, this is the last time I'll ask you to turn. Go back to John 15. John chapter 15. There are just two verses we're going to look at. John chapter 15, starting in verse 3. Jesus is speaking to His disciples. 
And he says, You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Each time he says you, there's the beginning of verse 3, the end of verse 3, a couple times in verse 4. Each one of those you's is plural. It's like saying y'all. Okay, that's what people say where I'm from, right? They say y'all. He says, y'all are already clean because of the word which I have proclaimed to you. So we're already clean. Amen? That is good news. You're already clean. And then he says, abide in me and I in y'all. Each one of you abide in me and I will abide in each one of you, Christ is saying. We're clean, but we're called to abide. We're individually perfect in the eyes of God, yet we're called collectively to be God's people and to abide in Him and to fellowship with one another. And it's supposed to be that way, okay? The only way that we can abide in the light is if we're abiding together. You've heard probably the charcoal illustration. I just grilled some burgers last night and was thinking about this. Because if you're not cooking with charcoal, you're not cooking. And I had the charcoal in the grill. And of course, every time it gets poured in from the, uh, the starter, uh, there are ones that go different places. And if the, one of those charcoal uh, briquettes was allowed to be there by itself, it wouldn't be long before that briquette was no longer warm, was no longer vibrant. It would die out quicker than the rest. Jesus said that we need to abide in Him, each of us, together. We're in it together. We're there to keep each other on track. Because none of us is perfect, but you better believe that you're going to be doing better when you're in the presence of God's people, uh, His people that honor Him and honor His Word. You won't be able to do the Christian life on your own. And then he says something confusing in verse 7. Uh, back in 1 John chapter 1, if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Okay, this all makes sense. This is all good. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Didn't Jesus just say in John fifteen three that we're already clean? He says, if we walk in the light... We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of His Son cleanses us from all sin. So let's finish with this. Okay, cleansing is a past and a present event. If you're looking for places <clears throat> where it's a past event, you could, of course, look at John 15, 3. There's also Acts 15, 9. In Acts chapter 15, verse 9, uh, we hear that God has already made a group of people clean. And then Ephesians 5, verses 25 and 26 Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved, past tense, the church, and gave Himself, past tense, up for her, having cleansed her, past tense, okay? Christ cleansed His bride. And then a present event, because we have this verse. There's no other verse that talks about cleansing in the present tense for God's people. We have this verse here that says it's also a present event. To put it not so simply this quandary that there is, John MacArthur says it this way, How can one reconcile the comprehensiveness and permanence of God's forgiveness and the imputing of perfect righteousness to believers at salvation with the continual need for Christian penitence? Got it? <laughs> right? Layman's terms, if we're already forgiven, why do we still need cleansed? Okay, that's the question. If we're already forgiven, why do we still need to be cleansed? Well, we needed to be and we still need to be cleansed. We need to be made clean. Um, talking about before, why we originally needed to be made clean, it's because those who are dead in sin need to be, as that one hymn says, washed in the blood. Right? You need to come to Jesus for the cleansing power, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's an initial purifying element that happens at salvation. When a person believes and trusts in Christ alone for salvation and His blood shed on the cross, there's an initial work that happens that purifies you and you're made clean at that moment. 
It's reconciliation by purification is what happens in that moment. You're reconciled to God because He's purified you. But if you're no longer dead to sin, if you've been made, if you've been made alive to God, you still need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb, just like the hymn says. Because as there was that initial purifying element whenever you first believed, there's a continual purifying element that's happening in your life. You're not living a perfect life, are you? If you are, we'll have you preach every Sunday, okay? Um, You're not living a perfect life. There's a continual purifying that needs to happen through the blood of Christ. And it's still reconciliation by purification. You're still being reconciled to God and His people by His blood. It's not saying that you have become unsaved. It's saying that there's a relationship that needs reconciled, that needs a purification element in it. If you're a believer, you have been reconciled to God, but just as I've been married to my wife, if I were to do things to sin against her, that relationship would certainly be hindered. That doesn't mean we're unmarried. Okay, we're still married. But it means that there's a relationship that needs reconciliation. And let me just put this forth to you. The only way that a marriage can be reconciled is by the blood of Christ. Every relationship, the only way that it can be truly reconciled, that it can be made anew, that things won't just be swept under the rug to be brought out later, but the way that they can truly be forgiven, the way that every wrongdoing can be cast aside so that both parties are reconciled truly, that both, both of their hearts are, are given to one another and not hoarding things and, and seeking to do harm still. The only way that that can happen is through the blood of Christ. True forgiveness can only come through Christ, that reconciliation. And God gave us a picture in the First Testament, Leviticus chapter 13. You can write that down. Leviticus 13 is where it talks about the lepers. If someone had leprosy, they were put outside of the camp. That person was no longer allowed to be in the camp with God's people. To come back into the camp, there were several things that needed to happen, but one of the things was that the priest, the one who was the Levite in the camp who was in charge of doing ritualistic purifications, he would come out and he would do all kinds of like sprinklings and markings on the thumb, things like that, to cleanse that person so that the person may be allowed to come back into the camp. He was able to declare the person clean. They were considered unclean. So the priest was to make the leper clean and to bring the leper back into the camp. In the same way, Jesus is our great high priest. He's the last priest we'll ever need. And whenever we have an issue with God's people, whenever we cause a divide or someone else causes a divide, where there's a broken relationship that's in need of reconciliation, our great high priest can heal that relationship. Still by His sacrifice, still by His work, He will continue to purify His people by reconciling them through His grace. That's the same thing that's happening in the church today, and it happens in the light. Kittle, who is uh, the last name, Kittle is the last name of a guy who's like a Greek expert. He says this about uh, cleansing and uncleanness. Uncleanness is not just a lack of cleanness. Uncleanness is a power which positively defiles. So if one of us is walking in darkness, there's a divide that goes up between us and the light. And all of God's people are are in the light, or should be, right? You've got God's people in the light, and here you are outside of the light. You're on the outside looking in at that point. It doesn't mean you're not saved. If you've truly believed, if you've been saved, you've been saved. But if There's darkness in your life. If you're not living in the light and walking in the light, you will be on the outside looking in. And the only way that you can be brought back into fellowship with God's people is still through the blood of Christ. There's a union in the death of Christ and in the resurrection, the life that He gives. There's a union there that you won't find anywhere else. You have to walk away from the darkness. You have to repent. You have to tell God. That you don't want to be in the darkness. You want to be in the light as He is in the light and as people are in the light. And then you will have fellowship. Then you will grow. 
First Peter 3.18 is true. First Peter 3.18 says, Jesus died once for all. That is true. But foot washing is still true. Foot washing goes on. It's something that we do together. It's something uh, that requires participation. Jesus called us in John chapter 13 to come together and to serve one another. You can't do that when you're in the darkness. You can't be a slave of God and a slave of others if you're in the darkness. You must be in the light. It's about a humble life of repentance. Life in the light is full of humility. It's full of wisdom. It's full of holiness. We're slaves resting at the feet of Christ. We're asking Him to make us into the church He wants us to be. We're in it together. Let's pray. God, we thank You so much. Words can't express how grateful we should be to You that You have called us into the light, that You Yourself are in the light, that You've given us Your Spirit, You've given us the power to be able to live the Christ life. We ask that You would bless this fellowship, that we would see the need for us collectively to be in the light together, to love one another, to love You, to hold one another accountable, to encourage one another, to pray for one another, to wash each other's feet, to lift up You and Your Word, that You might be the one who receives all the honor, all the glory, all the attention under this roof. God, make Yourself to be preeminent in our hearts, to have first place in everything. Mold us and shape us into the people You want us to be, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.